All right, the passion and the glory. This is the uh, second lesson in this uh, series where we are going over the final events in Jesus' life, hour by hour. And this lesson is entitled, His Last Words. Interesting, since the invention of uh, audio and video recordings, we've, uh, we've witnessed some pretty amazing things. For example, the, the last words and the reactions of pilots before a, before a plane crash, when the rescuers, uh, they find the, what's called the black box. It's not always black if you notice in the picture. And that box, you know, it records a lot of information about the uh, plane itself, but also contains the audio recording of the pilots. And sometimes their conversation and what's going on just moments before the uh, before the plane crashes, that's, that's just amazing stuff. Or footage of wars being fought, shown in real time on the news. Even crimes and gun battles captured on cell phones and broadcast across the internet for millions of people to see. I mean, we're, we're watching things that just were not possible 50 years ago. Of course, there was no such technology in Jesus' day, but nevertheless, I, I would like to describe as best I can, the last images and words experienced by the Lord before His death. These were recorded by eyewitnesses whose accounts have been preserved in their written records. You see, the Bible is our black box, so to speak, for these events that took place a long time ago. So uh, in today's class, we're going to look at the, the last things that Jesus saw and experienced. The first scene is the Jewish trial itself. Mark chapter 14 uh, talks about that. Jesus has been arrested by temple and Roman guards after being betrayed by Judas in the garden. The apostles all run away. He's left alone with his captors. He's brought first to Annas, the uh, former high priest and the father-in-law to the current high priest, Caiaphas. Uh, he kept the title high priest a little bit like our presidents in our country. Even former presidents are still referred to as president. It's a title that they keep even when they're not in office. It was the same thing with the high priest. The high priest kept the title high priest even if he was not serving, even after retirement. And this was the case here. Of course, they brought him to Annas, probably done to formulate some kind of charge against Jesus, which would justify a trial. Eventually, Jesus is before the Jewish court, the Sanhedrin, of the high priest who is serving at that time, Caiaphas, who has convened, a, today we call it a special inquiry in the early hours of the morning. We need to realize that it was illegal to call such an assembly at night in order to prosecute a capital case. That was against the law. But their mission to provide some sort of due process in order to condemn and execute Jesus was urgent and a charge against him needed to be formulated. And so one accuser after another is brought forth without success because each one is contradicting the other one. Finally, in utter frustration, Caiaphas himself addresses Jesus and simply asks him if he believes that he is the Messiah, to which Jesus answers in the affirmative because he cannot lie, even to protect his life, and he cannot avoid confessing the truth concerning his actual identity. So Mark, in the Gospel of Mark, tells us that Jesus is then condemned to death based on his own declaration what all the false accusers could not produce with their lies, Jesus accomplishes simply by telling the truth about himself. While Peter denies Jesus in the dark and cold courtyard outside, Jesus accepts his sentence of death while standing bound before the Jewish leadership inside the high priest's house. Now once the charge against him is set, the night of horror begins as his tormentors spit, beat, mock, and slap the Son of God. And the words of Isaiah the prophet are fulfilled. I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation, 
and spitting. In Matthew 27, 11 to 31, we move to the second scene and that is the, the Roman trial. After having falsely accused and tortured him, the Jewish leaders bring Jesus to the Roman governor, Pilate, because although they had sentenced him to death, only a Roman official could carry out an execution. They did not have the permission to carry out an execution. Only the Romans could do that. Let's read uh, Matthew 27, a long passage, but Matthew describes it very clearly. It says, now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor questioned him saying, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, it is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And he did not answer him with regard to even a single charge. So the governor was quite amazed. Now that the feast of the governor was accustomed to release for the people any one prisoner whom they wanted. At that time they were holding a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? For he knew that because of envy they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him a message saying, have nothing to do with that righteous man. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. But the governor said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They said, crucify him. And he said, why, what evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more saying, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood, see to that yourselves. And all the people said, his blood shall be on us and on our children. What a, what a chilling final sentence when you consider what has taken place since then. Um, Pilate, after questioning Jesus, realizes that there's no evidence. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a government official. You know, he's going by the rules. I mean, he'd, he'd crucify him in a heartbeat. That's not a problem. But as a, as a governor, as a judge, he wanted the law. What, what purpose, what law has he broken? That's why he kept asking that. So he realizes that there's no evidence or even a crime deserving the death penalty and he vainly tries to free the Lord, but is unsuccessful because the cries of the Jewish mob, incited by the priests and other Jewish leaders complicit in the effort to have Jesus put to death, all of this threatens to spill over into a riot. And Pilate, in an effort to appease them, turns Jesus over to the Roman guards where his ordeal of suffering is about to continue. In verse 26 it says, then he released Barabbas for them, but after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. One sentence, just a few words, he had him scourged. Roman soldiers used short whips made of leather strips to which were attached bones and lead bits at the tips for maximum injury. And the prisoner was tied to a column or a post or a tree and two soldiers on either side would whip him you know, taking turns. And the objective was to open the flesh, to make sure that there were open wounds uh, for maximum pain. In verse 27 we read, then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him, a cohort, a group of about 600 to 1,000 men. All were present to watch since torture was conducted as a cruel spectacle, appealing to bloodlust, Verse 28, they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and after twisting together a crown of thorns they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand and they knelt down before him and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. So they dressed him in a robe, put a reed in his hand, plunged a crown of thorns on his head and they mockingly addressed him as king, even kneeling before him in order to humiliate the subject that they were torturing. Verse 30, they spat on him and took the reed and began to beat him on the head. 
After they had mocked him, they took a scarlet robe off of him and put his own garments back on him and led him away to crucify him. You know, they spat, him, uh, they spat on him, they took the reed away, again, as a sign of his powerlessness. And they, they beat him on the head, driving the thorns further into his skull while laughing at him, and then they led him to his death. The purpose of this unnecessary torture, think about it, he's been condemned to die, he's going to die, why not just get it over with? Now the purpose of this unnecessary torture and cruelty by the Roman soldiers was to destroy the prisoner's spirit before destroying his body with crucifixion. And it also served as a visual object lesson to any other Jew who might have plans to undermine <coughs> Roman law. It was a billboard, it was an advertising that said, see what happens? If you challenge Roman rule, see what happens? This guy over here, he had thousands of people following him. He was a famous rabbi, the crowds were there. He did all kinds of things, but look what we're doing to him. So if you think you have power, if you think you can kind of mount up a resistance, you better think twice. If we could see through the eyes of Jesus at this point, what we would notice most of all was that there was not a single drop of human pity or compassion in their attitude, not at all. As I said, their goal was to completely destroy him psychologically before they destroyed him physically. And that moves us to the scene number three, the final scene, and that's the crucifixion itself. Once the beatings and the mockery were over, he was led out of the city to be crucified. Luke 23 tells us he was too weak to carry his own cross. The cross formation was about eight feet high. And so Simon from Cyrene, modern day Libya, was pressed into service as, a, as the large noisy crowd made its way outside the walls of the city to Golgotha. Uh, a name meaning the place of the skull for the actual execution. Matthew 27, 33 and 4 tells us that prisoners were given wine mixed with myrrh to calm them down. Now, this was not an act of mercy, but it was done so that the condemned person would not resist and move about while the nails were being driven through their hands and through their feet. Jesus, we note, refused to drink, wanting his mind to be clear right to the end because he still had things to do. Matthew 35 tells us that they crucified him, one large nail per hand and foot. In most cases, death came slowly from a combination of thirst, pain, exhaustion, and finally, asphyxiation. They hung on the cross and they, they, there was a little foot thing there where they could push themselves up to breathe, but eventually the pain and the exhaustion, they no longer could push themselves up. So going down like this with their arms up in the air, they eventually choked to death. That was usually the, the cause, of, uh, cause of death. Uh, and Matthew 35 as well tells us that it was the custom that the soldiers who were responsible for the execution also shared any clothing or valuables left by the one who was being crucified. In Jesus' case, they gambled for his robe, not wanting to divide it among themselves because it was seamless, and they waited for him to die. Matthew uh, 37, 43, once uh, crucified, the people not yet satisfied with his suffering, imagine, all the torture and suffering he's gone through, they're not satisfied. They continue to hurl insults at him while he hangs on the cross, suffering and dying in the most humiliating fashion. Talk about hard-hearted. Matthew 44, even the two thieves hung on either side of Jesus were insulting him as well at the beginning. Beaten, bleeding, degraded, in terrible pain, Jesus looks over the scene before him and he sees the cruelty of the guards, the hatred of the crowd, the mocking of the religious leaders, the abandonment of his disciples, and he finds the strength to say seven things before he dies on the cross. Seven last things that he said from the cross. 
the first. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they, have, what they are doing. Luke 23, 34. The very first words from his mouth while he hung on the cross were not concerning his own pain or the injustice of it all or a cry for help or a curse on his tormentors, but rather a plea to God on behalf of his murderers. The second thing is found in Luke 23 as well. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man, he is not, uh, he's done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember, we, uh, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said to him, and here's the second thing, truly I say to you today you shall be with me in paradise. Notice that in Matthew 27, 44, it says that both thieves were cursing him at first. So what do you think finally convinced one of them to believe? The miracles? The doctrine? I would say absolutely not. The thief witnessed the power of forgiveness working in love. He heard from Jesus the words of forgiveness towards his enemies and he was moved to seek forgiveness for himself. That's what convinced him. You know, the lesson of the thief on the cross is not that it's never too late to be saved. I've heard sermons like that. And I suppose in a way, you know, that's true. Uh, or the lesson is not that baptism is not necessary for salvation. Uh, you, I get that question so many times on Bible talk, you know, there's so many comments and letters that come in that, that I've, you know, Hal and I have prepared a ready-made answer and I just go and you know, cut and paste and put that as the answer because people come back with that all the time. But that's not the lesson of this, that you don't need to be, you, know, uh, you don't need to be baptized. The lesson here is that the power of salvation is love. Love unto death if necessary. That's what drew men to Christ. His great love and the love that was demonstrated right here while he was on the cross forgiving his enemies. This is what impressed that thief to ask God to also forgive him. The third thing that Jesus said um, in uh, John this time, we find this passage, John 19, 26 and seven. It says, when Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. After he is crucified, Jesus' mother and John approach the cross and the Lord puts her into the care of the apostle that he loved. That's the third thing he said before he died. We know that Jesus is divine not only because of his great miracles, but while the greatest battle for humanity is being waged at Calvary, he has his eyes on all the details and all the needs of everyone that is in front of him, even the care of his earthly mother when he will no longer be there to look after her himself. The third thing that Jesus said. The fourth thing that Jesus said. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama uh, bathani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, Jesus deals with those the furthest away from himself first, right? The ones who murdered him, they're the ones furthest away from him. And then, you know, his enemies, the thieves, his mother, his disciple, and then finally himself. He now grapples with his own suffering. He bears the final crushing punishment for the sins of all men, and that is suffering, excuse me, separation from God. You know, I know that sometimes we, you know, we, we do a communion talk and I've heard individuals go into the physical suffering that Jesus you know, experienced. You know, the nails were this long and then they go into the medical explanation of how painful that is. And of course, we don't deny that. But it wasn't the physical abuse and pain that atoned for sin. 
These were the natural consequences of men's sin, men's ignorance and hatred of God. Jesus experienced these in one way or another throughout His life and ministry with its culmination at Calvary. It's not like He had physical suffering on the cross and that was the only time. I mean, as soon as He started His ministry, He started to suffer. He was attacked and condemned and people attempted to kill Him. How many times they wanted to stone Him, throw Him off the cliff. So physical suffering was nothing new. No, the suffering that paid the price for sin was paid on the cross, but it was not the cross itself. It was the separation that Christ experienced from His Father while on the cross. This terrible agony caused even the Son of God to cry out. This was the punishment reserved for guilty sinners. This is the burden Jesus willingly took upon Himself on behalf of all sinners, on behalf of you and me, the separation from God. That's the pain, that's the suffering that atones for all of our sins. He suffered the, uh, uh, the second death, so to speak. Okay. We all suffer physical death, and I would say that there are people on earth who have suffered physical death even worse than this. You know, beatings and torture that goes on and on for months and years. Not to belittle what the Lord suffered, but it was the spiritual suffering that's the psychic, what I call suffering, the ache of the spirit in man that he suffered knowing that he was separated from God. That's the suffering that atones for us. The fifth thing he said, after this Jesus knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture said, I am thirsty, John 19, 28. So Jesus asked for a drink, why? He refused the, the myrrh, you know, he, he, he refused the sedative. Why ask for a drink? It seems that after having suffered so heroically, he would make it to the end without any physical assistance. I believe that he asked for a drink because he was human, and in doing so demonstrated that he suffered as a human, unprotected by some kind of spiritual, supernatural armor because that accusation has been made. Yeah, he was the son of God, but you know, he had this like special kind of you know, arm or spiritual armor, so he looked like he was suffering, but he didn't really suffer. He wasn't really uncomfortable. You know, the life that Jesus lived was perfect because he was God, and the life he offered in suffering was human because he was a man, and he suffered as a man. He was thirsty as a man would be at this point. The sixth thing that he said, therefore when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. From the beginning, God's plan was to send his son to live a perfect life and offer that life in death in order to pay for the moral debt of sin accumulated by all men, which in turn condemned everyone to separation from God eternally. So the history of the Jewish nation and the life of Jesus all led to this one act and now it was accomplished once for all and forever. So when we believe and repent and are baptized we need to understand that we lay hold of the finished work of atonement that Christ has made on our behalf. All sin has been dealt with forever. The payment for your sins and my sins has been made in full. There's nothing that I give to God to pay for my sins, nothing at all. The restitution that needs to be made for what I have done wrong, every single thing that I have done wrong in my life, the restitution for it to God has been completed by Jesus on the cross. I don't make restitution for any of it. I remember we, you know, some lessons I heard, even taught myself at the you know, very beginning of my ministry, you know, uh, the old thermometer thing. Somebody would put a thermometer up there and they'd say, well, here, you know, here's, here's what we do. We do our best you know, to be safe, to make restitution. So you know, from zero to about 60, you know, but we can't get better than that because we're not perfect. And now Jesus dies on the cross and he makes up that 40% that we're missing. So that we have 100% and we're good to go. Well, that's wrong, that's false, that's not the gospel at all. Yeah, if, you, if you're using that thermometer analogy, yeah, yeah, from zero to 
That's what Jesus, <laughs> He makes restitution for 100% of our sins. We don't, we, we don't and can't make restitution for them. He does that. Sometimes people say, well, then why, why should I bother uh, being good? Or why should I try to obey? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, brothers and sisters, that, that's faith. Every time I make an attempt to do what's right, I'm saying to God, I believe. And I will show you that I believe by the attempt I make to live righteously. Even though I don't succeed 100% of the time, the attempt that I make demonstrates demonstrates my, my faith. When Jesus said it is finished, he meant that nothing else needed to be done in order to make restitution for the sins of all mankind. It's done right there on the cross, no more. Take comfort in that idea because that idea is always the weak point in people's faith and belief system. Satan always attacks that point all the time. Okay? And then the seventh thing that he said, and final thing, and Jesus crying out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Luke chapter 23. So these are the last words of Jesus before he dies. Nothing that he does, uh, excuse me, notice that he does not die struggling to hang on to life as most men do, but he willingly offers his spirit in death to his Father. Again, why? because Jesus knew he had the power to both lay down his life and pick it up again, as John explains in John 10, 17 and 18. For this reason, Jesus says, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. And so Christians do not have the power to lay down their lives and then pick them back up again. We don't have that power. We do, however, have the assurance from the one who does have this power that when our lives are over, he will raise us up once again. We know that if he has the power to pick up his own life, he certainly has the power to pick up our lives as well. And that's the encouragement that we get from the gospel message. So we often ask ourselves, you know, what would we have done if we were there? You know, if we were transported back in time to that particular period in history, if we were there on that terrible day as Jesus surveyed the view from the cross, where would we be? Where would He see us? You know, it's not really necessary to go back in time in order to answer that question. We can judge what our position would have been back then simply by looking at our position here today. For example, if we went back and we were among that crowd, where would we be? Would we be among the Romans? You know, they were unbelievers, unwittingly opposing God and crucifying the Savior. Today we have many who do not believe and are in the darkness manipulated by Satan through their ignorance and opposing God and Christ without even knowing it. Remember, you're either with him or you're not. Would we be among the Jews? People who believed in God but refused to accept God's word made flesh. Today, how many claim to know and believe in God but refuse to obey His word and follow Jesus instead of traditions and doctrines not even based on the Bible? You know, we, we reject God when we reject Christ. And we reject Christ when we reject His word. Would we be among the disciples? I mean, they believed in Jesus but they refused to stand with Him when under pressure. Jesus said that many would receive the word, but when persecutions came, would quickly fall away. How right he was. Among our own members today, we have many who have confessed Christ and have been baptized, but when it comes time to choose between Christ and a bad habit, Christ and a sexual sin, Christ and worldly friends, Christ and the pressure of family or jobs, they, like the early disciples, run away and watch from a distance the mob who killed him. Or would we be on the cross with Jesus? See, that's the only place. That's the only other thing that's there. Only Jesus went to the cross. Nobody else went with Him. 
I mean, think about it for a second. There could have been 12 crosses on Calvary that day. There could have been. If the soldiers would have caught the disciples and they confessed Christ, they would have been crucified with him. There would have been 13 crosses. Well, take away in Judas, you know. However, we know that only one was willing to go. Today, all those who confess his name sincerely repent of their sins and baptized and follow Christ until he returns. These are the ones on the cross with Jesus, according to Paul, Romans 6, 3 to 5. There was only one place to be back there and there's only one place to be today and that is on the cross with Jesus. You know, in various locations around the world, people have built crosses all over the place. You've probably seen some. I mean, uh, places like Rio de Janeiro, and, you know, Jesus, but in the form of a cross. In Montreal, I mean, lots of crosses, but you know, there's a cross on, on the hill, on a, there's a mountain in the middle of the city, and there's a cross on top of that mountain. You can see it from pretty much anywhere in the city, big old cross. And there's even a big cross here near, uh, in Edmond, in Oklahoma. And these are wonderful gestures done to pay homage to the Christian heritage of these places, but Christ does not want the cross on a hill or a mountain somewhere. He wants the cross within us. And He wants us on the cross with Him. So this morning, you've seen the video, you've, seen, you know, you've heard the black box, you know, the view from the cross that I've presented you based on the writings of the apostles and the early disciples. And based on what you've seen, ask yourself this question. What group would you have been standing with on that day? The unbelieving Romans, the disbelieving Jews, the cowardly disciples, or are you on that cross with your Savior, Jesus Christ? Of course, if you've never been there with Him before and would like to join Him on the cross, of course, repent, be baptized. Make the cross your own. If you'd like, if you left that position and would like to rejoin the Lord and His cross, then receive the prayers of the church and return. Wherever you are, the Lord is always calling out to you from the cross. All right, next time we get together, His last miracle is what we will discuss. Good, thank you for your attention.